open this up. All right. All right. Here we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to York History Group. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. My name is Kevin Freeman, and I will be your host for today's segment. Today is June 20th, 2021. We're surely going to miss Elaine Wood and Kevin McKinney today, but they will be back soon. So don't worry. If you're joining us live, please type your location into the comments section below. And also feel free to type in any questions you may have for our guest. Before I introduce my guest, I'd like to talk a moment about Old York Historical Society. For those of you who don't know, Old York has been an integral part of our community here in York for a very long time. Old York has an amazing collection of artifacts, wonderful archives, several house museums, and of course, our keepers of the old jail. If you're watching this, no doubt, like me, you love local history. So I just want to suggest you check out Old York and see what they have to offer. As a, I am a member of Old York, and I am honored to be on the board of trustees, I can say without a doubt, Old York would love to hear from you and welcome you aboard. You can find their website at oldyork.org. I met today's guest at Old York and have since just loved to pick his brain. He is an enormous source of information on all aspects of early history that I have been able to throw at him. He is currently pursuing a PhD on early modern English social and cultural history as, as well as the history of Maine. With that, I welcome Danny Bottino. All right. Hello hey. there. Hello well, thank there. you. How are you? Oh, excellent. Good. And um, I guess we'll just start with my PowerPoint. Okay. You could bring that up. Yeah. yeah. And for our viewers, uh, Danny has created a PowerPoint presentation here, which you can check out. And um, like I said, if you have any questions throughout the talk for Danny, uh, please feel free to type them into the comment uh, section below. And so we'll get started yes. with the PowerPoint. Yeah, questions would be awesome, yes. Yeah, so I've got a little PowerPoint here. It covers some, some basic facts, um, you know, hopefully things that most people don't, you know, actually know. Um, and I'll try to talk only here for about, you know, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. And then hopefully the rest of it will just be, you know, questions and we can just talk about anything that, you know, Kevin or anyone else wants to. Uh, you know, talk about. Um, but I'll be looking at burial grounds in the uh, York region. So um, north of Boston, let's say. So modern day Essex County, Rockingham County, and then York County, Maine. But um, I mean, those are the graveyards that I've been able to actually reach and to make journeys to take take um, photos of. For my PhD thesis, I am doing uh, quite a bit of work on uh, burial, burial grounds in late 1600s into the early 1700s. So this, I've been, I, I'd say, you know, actually, I started getting interested in um, burial grounds when I was a teenager, probably a young teenager, when I, I started at Old, Old York in the junior docent program. And so one of my junior docent projects was to map the Old York First Parish burial ground. And that was the first major time I really looked at a um, you know, 17th century, 18th, 18th century burial ground um, really you know, deeply. Uh, since then, I've looked at maybe, I would guess, more than 50 of them. Uh, scattered throughout the northern, the northern um, New England region. So let's take a look at what we have here. I just wanted to start with the next slide um, at some graveyard basics, so basic terms, some basic facts. Um, when you go into a um, burial ground from the 1600s through the late 1700s, what you will see are usually three, three, three types of burial, uh, burial marking stones. And these are usually called headstones and then footstones. And then um, the third type is a uh, field, um, a uh, field, uh, field stone. And 
the headstones and the footstones are, as you may guess from the, uh, from the terms, used to mark where the head of the person was buried and then where their feet are buried. And so I have a picture of a typical headstone. The headstones are the ones that you most likely notice that so they are much larger. They are more likely to still be extant. Footstones at the feet of the, of the body are much smaller. You usually don't have anything carved on them. Sometimes they have the person's name carved on them. Usually there's no imagery. Sometimes there is, but usually not. And the uh, head, headstone then, as we see in the picture here, this is a uh, typical late, um, late 70th century head, headstone um, in um, the point of, point of, point of uh, graves burial ground in Portsmouth, one of the oldest in Portsmouth. And you'll see usually there's imagery on the sides of the stone and then on the top of the stone there. And then in the middle of the stone, there is usually text. And in the earliest stones, it's almost always very simple. You have the name, uh, if the person is, um, is, um, is uh, married, then the person that they are married to is almost always mentioned. If they're not married, then, they're, um, then the person's parents are usually mentioned. And then you have the age and the date that they died. And stone uh, and the stone is almost always, almost always, um, almost always, almost always this slate, this dark slate here. Um, sometimes you see uh, sand, sand, sandstone is uh, used, but uh, usually slate. And then we get to marble by the late 1700s, early 1800s. Marble takes over and slate is is pushed out. And what is a field stone then? So a field stone is the third major type. And as you could maybe guess from how intricate the carvings are on a stone like this one that you're looking at, usually, especially in this very early period, only the wealthiest people could hire a carver, either one of the really fancy carvers who lived in the Boston area or even a um, local carver who probably didn't charge as much, but still charged a large sum. So if you weren't able to do that, then you would, if you still wanted to mark the body with a permanent stone marker, you would just put a stone down, usually without any carving on it. And these are called field, um, field, uh, the uh, field stones. And uh, often nowadays, people see these stones in a, a burial ground and it's hard to tell whether these are actual field stones that were put down to mark someone or they're just random stones of course as we know you know the ground is very is very rocky here so sometimes it's hard to really tell and of course over the centuries the stones have been moved or have been lost or have been broken um now Sometimes you do see just the person's name or just you know a, a couple letters carved into these uh, stones if you look very, very closely. Um, now let's get to the term of what is this place called? What, what did the people who buried their uh, family and their friends, uh, what did they call the place that they buried them in the 1600s, 1700s? And it was almost always some form of the term burying ground, burying yard, burying place. Um, graveyard is used, but not too often. Churchyard is also very common if they were in the area of a local church, which often they actually weren't. Um, um, Cemetery is the word that most 21st century people use. And cemetery actually was not used by anyone in the 1600s through the 1700s. It was first, I believe, first began to be used in the 1800s when you have a, the modern cemetery movement, which I haven't, you know, is beyond the period of history which I study, um, you know, which I focus on. But the modern cemetery movement is basically gave birth to what we have now. So we have well-ordered plots, we have paths, we have everyone's, everyone's stone is in a certain row in a certain area. They're not jumbled up, they're not 
put in a sort of what we would view as a, a you know messy pattern, which is how they were earlier. And so with this new ordered burying place, we have a new term for it, cemetery, which was coined around the same time and comes from, I um, believe it comes from Greek, which means it means a peaceful place or something along those lines. And so you can see death, the fact of death is being taken out. Cemeteries were also at this time turned into public parks or at least meant to be parks where people could just take a peaceful walk in have a um, picnic in maybe. And so um, they, the purpose of you know, burying someone and the purpose of death and, and dying is um, somewhat taken and it's, it's um, mellowed, mellowed out. Whereas for people in the 17th century, 18th century, death and burial, you know, death and the um, and the concept of the um, after after afterlife and um, spiritual is you know spiritual elements in general that was the primary purpose of a um, burial ground. Um, of course, I'm talking talking in pretty general terms here about culture in general. Um, once you get down to the details of what people actually thought and did, it's, you know, varies, which is one of the fundamental problems of history in uh, general. I already talked about slate and marble here. Uh, people often ask, what are the earliest dated stones in the area? Uh, within the earliest stones that we find within um, New England as a whole are in Boston. Uh, you know, everyone, you see different stones claimed in different sources. Sometimes a stone that people claim, oh, this is the oldest, it can't be found nowadays, so maybe it's been lost. But I have seen stones in the Boston area dated to the 1650s. Uh, and then once you get, but there's very few of them, once you get to the 1660s, then you see a much larger number. And they start to be finely carved in the 1660s. In the York area, um, the earliest stone is in, is this one here, Portsmouth, uh, dated to 1680, 82. However, there are earlier tombs in the South, in the South Street um, burial ground in Portsmouth. There's the, so this is, not, this is not a gravestone. It's a large um, slab over where people are, are buried under it. Um, and that is a woman named um, Cut. I forgot what her first name was, one of the famous, you know, prominent Cuts family. Um, and that's dated to 1671. So that's the oldest, oldest dated burial marker I found in the seacoast region. This one here, this gravestone is the earliest dated gravestone. In Maine, the earliest stone I found is in Wells and dates to 1700. And that's a member of the um, Wheelwright family. So, we covered some basics there. All right, we can move on to the next slide. So we saw the death's head image on the previous slide. That's the skull, the winged skull, as it's often called. Um, and that's the most prominent image that we see on these stones, starting with the earliest stones that I mentioned in the 1660s. You start seeing this image here. You can see it on this slide here too. And this is, this is the, the dominant image all the way through the 17, 1780s, 1790s. In um, some, in some burial grounds, in others it falls out of favor and is barely used. You know, after 1740, 1750, and the one that takes over, either in some places earlier on or in other places, York notably, only in the later part, latter part of the 1700s is this second one here, which is this angel looking face, a cherub. Uh, I think angel is a um, better term. Some people call it a you know, cherub. Um, and so we can see these become very prominent. You can see these as early as the late 1600s, but they become very prominent and really start to take over by the late 1700s. So this gravestone here is dated to 1775. As for what these two images mean, this is an area I could, I could talk for hours. This is the sort of the heart of the, if you wanna look at 
grave markers as a primary source on cultural history. This is the uh, sort of the, the best way, the most fruitful way to do it is to talk about what these images meant. Because these, this is clearly meant to be the central image on the stone. Um, and it's what people see, you know, it's the first thing you see when you go to, you know, look at it. And um, of course, you know, there are other parts of the stone, the, the text clearly matters too. And some people, scholars have recently argued that in focusing on the imagery of the stone so much, we haven't, people haven't even read what's actually written on them. So maybe we should start doing that. Um, but the death's head, looks very stern and looks very sinister even one one could say and it's um very stark too and it clearly represents death in, in some way but of course it also has wings on it so what what does that mean um many you know scholars have different theories the ones you know that the one that i stick to is that this is simply meant to represent the fact that death happened. So that is a, a fact, you can't alter that. And for the Puritan Calvinists who buried people under this image here, throughout the 1600s into the 1700s, most people who died did not die certain of whether they would be saved or whether they would be damned. Um, even if they were certain, their families often weren't. And so, um, you have to represent the fact that death happened, and then you have to represent the fact that the afterlife will happen. And that, for most Calvinists, was what really mattered, because it was timeless. The afterlife, whether hell or whether you've been saved, um, never ended. So if we look at the finite length of life, whether it's one year or 90 years, that seems to be nothing when you look at the infinite afterlife so that's what really matters and so you have the you have the fact that the soul has died and then the soul is going so you know somewhere and that was all that calvinist that the you know puritan settlers could really say um you know and so they, they left it at that really and um in this stone here which is in um York's um, first, first parish burial ground actually has more than the usual, you know, name, date, um, you know, parents on it. it. Actually has quite a bit of text here. And it says, as, as you can see on the slide, John Bragdon was a promising youth. He died young. He was only 22. He was 20, his 23rd year. So he was what we would call 22 years old um, with some comfortable hope in his death hope being capitalized meant that he had hope of being saved after great dis um dis um dis um dis um stress of soul and solemn warnings to young people not to put off their repentance to a deathbed so he clearly was in agony over his over the state of his soul and whether he would be saved or not even if he wasn't some, you know, either the um, minister or his family or someone was clearly worried about the state of, of his soul and they were, they chose to put that in very stark terms on his stone here. I believe that this, this text does give us some hope. In fact, he says some comfortable hope that he was saved, but the question is still open. In fact, he may have been damned. Um, and so I believe that summarizes what this image represented to most people viewing it. Um, as for the angel, I believe it's pretty similar. The angel is also perhaps not a real angel, but perhaps like the death's head, a representation of a person's soul um, going somewhere. And of course, hell doesn't have you know happy looking angels. So this is a more hopeful image. This is uh, saying that, you know, the soul may be saved. The soul is going to be in a, you know, happy place. Um, and, you know, that could be why it, it although it's, it's present very early on, there were always hopeful people. Um, 
this could be why it does take over in the later part of the 1700s because Calvinism softens a little bit. People in general get more, um, have more, had greater hopes of, of being saved, to put it simply, which is a general fact. Um, and so we have a slightly happier version of theology here, perhaps. Um, and go on to the next slide here. I believe that the um, death's head and the wing um, angel both represent death and they both represent the um, afterlife. And so when Calvinists uh, were thinking about this, the, as I've mentioned, the primary thing that they thought of, they thought of it primarily in terms of time in terms of the limited time that people live on, you know, in their earthly life versus the infinite time that they will live in the afterlife. And so um, there's this time imagery that is so central in people's thoughts, I think at this time that they wanted to put it on their images of death on these gravestones. And I believe both the angel and the wing skull and the you know death's head represent that um as well as the wings representing flying off to afterlife they may also represent flying quickly going quickly flying as a is you know represent speed but on many stones you also see very clear time images so you see the the hourglass, uh, which we have on this stone here, which has a very early angel from 1704, but it has that, that hour, hourglass there, which means that, you know, basically life goes quickly. And of course, you see it very often on young people's stones. This, this, uh, this person here, this young boy, I believe was, um, to say, um, 11 years old, yes. So, um, of course, so you see it on older people too. Uh, it's, you know, 90 years is, is nothing. Never, never ending afterlife. Sometimes you also see um, the Latin words on it, uh, fugit um, aura, which means time flies, which also, of course, ties back into the um, wings that, that we uh, see. Um, also, perhaps this is a stretch, but um, the shoulders of the gravestone are um, rounded shoulders. And it may be that part of the reason that these were made in this fashion was to represent clock. You know, the, the, tall, the tall clock was uh, first used to tell time in the 1600s. And if you look at the shoulders, you can see, you know, you can see a sort of a clock shape there with the face of the clock on the top and then the um, body of the clock downwards. So that may have been a time imagery also. Um, and finally, perhaps it's fascinating to mention that the, um, the, um, the sexton was the church officer who usually buried people. And the um, sexton had two major jobs. So burying people, digging graves was one of them. The other one was bringing the, um, tolling the um, church, um, the church um, bell, which of course is used to tell time. Um, so it may be that people thought, well, you know, this, uh, this officer is tied into telling time. He should also dig people's graves. All right, so there we go. I rambled on uh, enough about that. We can move on here. Just a very clear image about you know what people were thinking about time, and the earliest stones have the most um, have the highest constant have the highest constant concentration of what I call you know time um, imagery, and so we see this very early stone in 1678 Boston of also of a uh, person who died young, uh, Joseph Tapping, I believe he was in his early 20s. And we see the, the, um, hour, hour, the um, hourglass there. We also see Fuja Aura is on the top. 
And then the most, you know, the clearest sort of image we have of the sense of time running quickly and being overtaken by death is this image here of Father Time fighting with death right there. And he, death is trying to end, the, end life. So to end the um, candle of life there. And death is snuffing it out. And Father Time is wrestling him, trying to, to stop him. But of course, he can't do that. Ultimately, time will uh, lose, it will run, run out, and then death will conquer. Um, so I think it was very clear in these early stones, and then as time, you know, went went on, people, you know, didn't, you know, it was already so well known in the culture that people didn't feel the need to put it in as such clear terms in the later stones. But you still see it. All right, so I think we're almost done with the PowerPoint here. Just got a little bit more. Um, so we've been looking at, you know, the typical, I would say higher, higher quality carved stones, usually made by carvers who lived in the Boston area. And then for people within, within, within York or other areas distant from Boston, they would ship stones. You know, people would come down to Boston or write letters to Boston probably. And then the stones would be sent out to them. But within many small towns, you see, you know, of course, people didn't, didn't want to do that. They didn't want to pay perhaps the, you know, um, higher, higher prices, or they didn't want to wait, or it was, you know, it was a big hassle traveling in the 1700s. And so you see local artists um, carving in a more primitive, perhaps you could call it style, a sort of folk, folk art style. And these are very regional styles. So sometimes you'll see the traits of a certain artist who operates within one town or within a small region. And I have two typical folk art images here. So we see this, this image on the top is a variation on the angel or death, death head, sort of a combo of both of them really, as well as these wheels, which could represent time, they could represent the uh, sun. Um, it's not you know, quite clear what they represent. Um, and this is a local style. And then on the bottom, we have a, a, a um, local artist who is also creating his own variant on the um, death's head. Uh, image. So we have the wings and we have some sort of skull looking thing, but you can see the, the death has turned into some sort of spider, um, which I don't know if that was purposeful or perhaps Carver was simply trying to do his best to replicate the uh, styles that we saw earlier and was, wasn't able to. Um, and within York, within the York burial ground, uh, as far as I know, currently extant, there are no folk art styles. So I, I would guess that York did not have a, a local carver. Um, within Portsmouth, there are some. There are a very, a very few. Um, but most of the Portsmouth stones are also, I would guess, you know, higher quality Boston area carvers. Um, but when you go to more inland, rural towns, then you start to see a very high con concentration of these, of these um, more primitive, more primitive folk art style stones. Um, Kittery also do does not have any. All right, so next slide, we come to the end of the 18th century. And we have what basically takes over and pushes out the older styles, pushes out the, um, the um, death's head has been slowly fading out, but it's completely pushed out by the 1790s. The um, winged angel also, as well as the local, as well as the local folk art styles are all pushed out and taken over by a, a, a new style, which focuses on um, mostly urns and weeping um, willow trees also. Sometimes you just have a plain urn, but the, pic the picture here is what you almost always see, which is an urn, then a weeping willow tree over it. And 
this is very Grecian imagery here. And it's less Christian theology. It's less based in Christian imagery. It's more based in classical imagery. And, you know, there are many theories as to the rise, what, you know, what happened that caused this to come to dominate. I would say that it happened with a general turn in the culture throughout the region, throughout the country even. You know, it's, it's not just a, a local thing. Um, towards a more sentimental view of death as less focused on the um, afterlife, less focused on what's going to happen to people's souls, and more focused on mourning for the earthly life, and so interlinked with mourning memory of the um, earthly life also. And so you see mourning images often have these urns and these, um, these willow trees, which of course, you know, you know, are weeping willow trees, so people are crying at the fact that death has happened here. Um, and probably the, the big turning point, maybe the turning point was, um, um, was um, Washington's death. Uh, George um, Washington died in 1799. And that was a major mourning moment for the country, for the rather young country, uh, the founding, the preeminent founding father as he was seen of the country had just died. And so this was a national mourning moment. And so you have circulated throughout the country mourning images, which often featured these urns and people weeping at them and um, you know, Grecian imagery. And so I think that that was a major catalyst for the rise then in this grave, graveyard imagery, as well as a general view, a general more secular view of death as something sad that happened in the earthly life rather than looking forward to an uncertain afterlife. And so you'll see those come to dominate through the mid, through the 1850s, 1860s. I've seen them as late as the 1860s, 1870s. And then they're, they're basically vanished and they get taken over by a plethora of styles, hundreds of different styles. Everyone chooses their, their own image, really, their own style, which is what we still have nowadays. Um, should mention that marble takes over around the same time. So this is a, a, a um, slate stone here, but um, most of these urn um, willow type stones are marble by the 1830s. And there's one more style of, of stone, which I should mention, which is on the next slide, which is portrait stones. So these were always extant, you know, I would say from the late 1600s. Um, through the you know 1700s, and of course nowadays people still have portrait stones. Um, they never were the dominant type, but what they are basically is just a stone without the um, death head or the um, angel, but a uh, usually stylized portrait of the person who was buried there. And this this one here, um, Wells in uh, Wells, Maine, in the Ocean View uh, graveyard in in Wells is the highest quality portrait stone I have ever seen. It's a real portrait of, of this uh, man here, who was, I believe, a justice of the, of the peace. So he has his legal robes and a scroll there representing he's a very learned man. Um, and he has long flowing hair, which is fascinating. Most portrait stones are very stylized images. So they're just a um, generic woman, generic man. Sometimes they they look like um, babies or young children, even though when you, if you read these stone you see that they're not. Some people have argued that these are portrait stones also, and that the carver just you know didn't put you know just didn't wanted them to all be similar, didn't care about saying you know putting different features on them. Other people have argued that these are actually soul images and they represent the new newborn soul. So when the soul dies, when the body dies, the soul is still young and that these are actually soul images, not portrait images. Um, York Barrow Ground has just one portrait stone, which is um, the Mary um, Nason stone, um, um, which is grave as is sometimes known, which is in error, uh, of course, a popular folk, folk tale. Um, 
and she died in the 1770s, which I would say was the height of the portrait stones, actually. And it shows a portrait of a young um, woman there on, on her stone. And within Portsmouth, you can see similar portraits, which were probably carved by the same carver. I would say within York, um, this, this style, it's the only one in the graveyard. It probably had not been, had not been um, you know, used in, um, in the York area uh, up to that date, may have caused scandal. It may have broken the norms of what you put on people's stones, which may have caused gossip and scandal, which created perhaps the modern, the modern witch um, story. Um, I believe that is the, there is one more slide, but we will see, I believe. Yes, there is. So uh, I did not come up with, you know, all of this. Um, most of what I've told you comes from these five uh, sources here, as well as just from looking at, you know, hundreds of stones and various, and various burial grounds. Um, there's more scholarship on, you know, graveyards, um, but I've just chosen the five here that have been most um, useful, um, you know, to me. Um, and there are, there are some that I, I probably will, could be useful that I have not actually read yet. Um, Dietz, right there, the first one, although his up, updated book was published in 1996, he first published his, an article on, um, on grave, gravestone imagery in, I believe, in 1960. So he was the first major scholar or person in general to look at the stones in the way that I am, you know, doing so now. Um, although I think that we got some, some things wrong, we owe him a big, big credit there. Um, so I would recommend all of, all of these books, yeah, if you do want further, uh, further reading, further, further knowledge. Um, and um, you can, I do of the articles, so there's three books here, and then there's two articles, which the articles are more difficult to find, um, but I do have PDF copies of both of them. So if anyone really wants one of these two articles, I can you know, send them, send the article if someone would um, like that. All right, so there we go. Yes, so I hope I haven't talked too long there, but um, I will. I will stop there. Hey, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Very informative. Um, yeah, I have a couple of follow up questions, mm. if I may. Um, yes. I know you and I are talking about um, uh, doing uh, another segment that would be on um, the evolution of religion in New York, but yep. not specifically New York. Um, and so I know when I was talking, discussing this with you um, a few weeks ago, you were talking about Calvinism and how it merged sort of with um, Puritanism. And so um, I just, it was, it, was, it was revealing to me when you told me that um, then the Puritans came over here and then the religion actually started to evolve and um, that people really didn't think that they had a chance to go to heaven and um, people generally might have thought they were doomed to hell. Um, and then as that evolved, people became, I think that maybe we, I, I'm, I'm curious about two things, that, but I know that's a broad subject. And then also when Puritanism came to York um, during the submission, yeah. um, how that, that, was there a transition there in the way that people perceived death? Um, yeah. Were they forced to become Puritans? And before that, they were just kind of like <laughs> on their own to wander the wilderness. Yeah, well, uh, you know, those are excellent questions. I didn't go into that topic in too much depth because, you know, we'll be talking about it hopefully in the you know, later Zoom session, but it is very relevant to what we're talking about now. Um, and the brief thumbnails that Calvinism, you know, in general was within, 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 within Britain, the dominant strand of Christian Protestant um, um, theology. Um, and you have um, um, you have so-called um, the so-called Puritan movement, 
uh, is a what we could call perhaps a more hardline Calvinist movement, which sees the overall English Protestant church as still, still too Catholic and wants to get rid of what it sees as um, elements within the church, which are not only not needed for you know, proper worship and for getting to heaven, which is the ultimate goal, but are also perhaps, you know, leading to sin. So these are Catholic seeming elements within the church, like um, the uh, priest wearing um, ritual robes, clothing um, with, for the um, altar of the church being, being used. Um, Calvinists would, um, the more hardline Puritan Calvinists would want a table used a small wooden plain table rather than a fancy altar, right? So you have this Puritan movement um, becomes very prominent in the early 1600s. English, English Puritans are very prominent and they don't want in, to leave. In, yeah. yeah, but not necessarily in what we now call Maine. Not Maine, yes, right. So these are English people and they don't really, they want to stay within England and change the church. And ultimately by the early 1600s, they realize that they, they are failing to do that. The king does not like them. This is King Charles the first. And so they leave and they go to found Boston and then even more radical Puritans who just want to separate and found their own church are the um, Plymouth uh, people in 1620. Maine is not settled for the most part by, by these people. Um, the English, settlers who start to call this area Maine, settle in modern day Kittery, York, Wells, Saco. They are mostly from Western England, which is a Puritan center. So some of them are you know, Puritans, but that was not the primary motive to settle in Maine. The primary motive was to uh, found a lucrative colony. Gorges, Fer Fernando Gorges uh, had was given claim to the main area by the king. Neither of them knew exactly where it was. And so he simply wanted people to go there. And his cousin, Thomas Gorges, was an actual Puritan. He was a moderate Puritan, but he was still a Puritan. And so he was sent here as the main governor in the 1640s. So he you know, knew he was Puritan and he had his vision for a more Puritan church. But if you read his letters, which he wrote back to England in the 1640s, he realizes that he can't do that. And most of the people in Maine do not follow his Puritan thinking. And that's how the situation was until the takeover, as you mentioned, in the 1650s. Yeah. So do you think that, that the, the people's consciousness integrated with the Puritan methodology and the Puritan methodology at the time was to have the death masks? Um, because of the doom and gloom aspect of their their eternity, um, I, I I would say um, certainly even within Puritan Boston there are no grave gravestones um, up till the 1650s. There's no gravestones with death's heads on them until the Charleston Carver, the first major Carver, in the 1660s, um, and. The reason for that was probably because Puritans did not want to create a graven image. Um, they did not want to worship any image or even you know, be tempted to worship. And by the later 1600s, you do have these Puritan gravestones. And I believe Cotton, Cotton Mather does mention that we have graven images in our gravestones. We are not worshiping them. These are simply memories of the person. So they were very wary of that early on. They became less wary. But within York, we know that most people were you know, members of the Congre Congregational Puritan Church by the 1660s, when it's by the, you know, it's, it's founded in the early 1660s. So, and, they, and, they were, and they were required to be, correct? Mm, technically, yeah. But um, there was no, you know, you couldn't really force someone to go to right. church. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to tell, you know, because even if people did go to church, they may not have been too happy about it. So it's really, really hard to tell. We do know that Ferdinando Gorges died 1647 and his heirs, his grandson, um, Fernando Gorges Jr. 
Uh, so sometimes the two get mixed up, but this is his grandson in the 1660s, 1670s, trying to claim Maine. And of course, the Bay Colony, you know, Mass has claimed it and they have a Puritan government in place. And so Fernando Gorges Jr. tries to say, no, I am the real governor. And so he has a sort of like shadow government, which tries to take over power at various times. The most um, famous uh, incident happened in the 1660s, I, I believe, when the regular government was having a, a town meeting in the meeting house. And when they went to have lunch at the local tavern, the gorgeous, you know, rival government was waiting for that moment. They left for lunch and they went into the vacant meeting house and said, we are the real government. We're going to pass all these laws. Wow. Us now and, and kick them out. So this rival gorgeous government was probably the anti-Puritan movement. People who didn't like the Massachusetts Puritan government would have joined it, even if they didn't really care about gorgeous. So there is that anti-Puritan movement. Uh, yeah, see, I, I wasn't even aware of that. That's, um, that's amazing. And, and before we came on, I, I discussed just, I just want to read this quote that's in back, uh, um, volume two chapter 11, and he, and he talks about a little bit about what, what his um, interpretation of colonial York would have been. And he says, the colonial Sabbath was ushered in at sundown Saturday night and extended to Sunday midnight, a long weekend of cheerless formality at home and marked by a refrigerating aspect in public. Everything was calculated to turn one's thoughts to melancholy and despair. <laughs> the freemen of York were summoned to the services by beat of drum or sounding shell. As he arrived at the door with his family on horseback, he could look across the road to the burying ground, the pillory, the whipping post, the stocks in the old jail ground and contemplate the sufferings of the living unfortunates and in the building listen to sermons of the awful sufferings of the damned in eternal fire. Um, you know, that, that, that makes quite an impression on me. It's like, wow, people would go to church to hear that stuff. And for what, what, what did it give them? Um, I would think it would just give them fear. And it's a reflection of the, the death heads on the stones, I think. And, oh, yeah. then, and then as we transition beyond that, um, then we start to get into the angel. And I think that Lucy Moody, was it Lucy Sewell, uh, 1705? Lucy Sewell. Um... Yeah. So she's 1800, she has a nice urn, yes. Yeah, and she has, and there's, a, and, and, and she was, she was the, uh, she died the same day that she was born. Oh no, that's Lucy Moody. That's oh. the earliest stone, yes. <laughs> okay. Two and, Lucys, yeah. Yeah, and she had, uh, Hope was in capital letters on her headstone, I believe. Um, yeah. Resurrection, capital letters. Okay, so yeah. There is hope there, yes. Yeah, now that's a shifting point, is it not? Um, certainly, yeah, it's been noted that, you know, the children's stones for especially very young children, even in the 1700s, you know, even the early in the early 1700s, 1600s, have more hopeful sentiments on them than oh. older people. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think that the thinking was that it's really hard to tell, you know, whether this person lived a, a moral life and was predestined to be to be saved. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, we should be hopeful. And of course, you know, the, the grieving was by the parents was also greater and the mourning was greater than if it was someone who, who, who was older. And so there is that human urge to be more hopeful. Um, and we see that with uh, Lucy, Lucy Moody's stone because it says that on the stone, if you read it closely, this is the earliest dated stone within, within the uh, York uh, First Parish burial. Second oldest stone in... Um, in um, Maine that I have found. And it says that Lucy Moody died the same day she was born, July 1st, 1705. Thus, we may see that on one day, and I believe it says May, um, on one day, we can see that birth, um, bap baptism, death, and um, resurrection into heaven. Four things can all happen in, in one day. Yeah. So 
the hope of her being saved is explicitly stated on the stone. Yeah, yeah. And and my final my final question. Um, you you told me a while ago that it's possible that some of these um, icons on these images on top of the stones um, could have just been something that the the head stone carver could have had in stock. And when they were ordered, it's kind of like, well, you got to take what I have already created, and we'll we'll put the inscription below. But you got to you, there's no choices, um, which is an interesting hypothesis. Oh yeah, I I, I would think you have the death head has to come out of a certain culture about death in the 1600s, especially by the later 1700s. You know, death heads had been used for over 800 years at that point. This was what gravestone carvers carved. So what they had in, in their shops. So when you ordered a stone, this is what they would offer you. And so if you really didn't want that, you could say, I want a you know nice looking angel, can you carve a nice portrait? Um, or, but if you just you know didn't really care, you could say just give me a nice, a nice grave stone. Then they would probably send you what they had, which was the death death head. And you know that may not be for the person who ordered it. It may not have been a central part of their theology. Right. Yeah. It was kind of like a hit or miss type of thing. Yeah. Um, can, and yeah, so now I, now that creates another question. So can you tell the prosperity of the town by the dates on the stones? Oh, I, I would say so, definitely. Oh. Um, not just by the dates, but by other elements on the stones too. So Portsmouth has many 70th century stones, a very high con concentration. I'd say within Portsmouth, I found about 20, maybe maybe more stones dated to the 1600s. Um, and within, within York, you have zero. Within um, Maine, there's just one, the uh, stone from 70 hundred in, in Wells, which is just barely, you know, just barely 70th century, but it, it still counts. So this shows that people in Portsmouth, which is not that far right. you know, yeah. distant, were yeah. wealthier and they were able to buy stones in the 1680s, 1690s, whereas people in, you know, York and Wells and other towns were not able to. Of course, it's possible that these stones were lost in this, you know, 1692 Candlemas raid or, or yeah. other other raids. Portsmouth right. was not raided um, heavily. Um, so that's possible, but I, I would say that people of Maine were just poorer. And also you see extra images. So within Portsmouth, you can see very fancy stones yeah. with um, sometimes the carvers sign them. Uh, they only carvers only did this on their you know, fanciest stones, stones that they really really worked hard on. They wanted you to know that they had made this stone. Yeah. Within Portsmouth, there's quite a few of those. Within Boston, definitely. Within York, within Maine, I haven't found any any signed stones. Wow. What what about Kittery? Kittery um, does not have that many 18th, 18th century stones within. The only burial ground in Kittery that has 18th century stones is the Kittery Point burial ground, which is right next to the Lady Pepperell House, if you know yeah. where that is. It's a very yeah. nice one, yeah. but there's only about 10 18th century stones there, which I think shows that Kittery was not a very prosperous town. Right. Um, and none of these stones are of you know, high quality. They're just average stones that the carver would have in his, in his shop. You know, if you wanted the extra features that the Portsmouth people have, the Boston people have, you would have to order that. Kittery people just bought the, you know, regular generic stones. Yeah, that's... Um... Of course, the Pepperell family has their own tomb, right? Pepperell family, very dominant, very rich. And they do have the Pepperell family tomb, which the richest people didn't have gravestones. They had tombs. So within Kittery, you do have that. What was the distinction um, between a tomb and a mm. so a tomb? If you've seen them, is a large, you know, slab. Sometimes it's a so-called raised tomb. We have a little box. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a large slab on the ground, and yeah. under these slabs is a large space, a like under underground cavern, in which you have the coffins of a family group are buried there, and within. You know, within Boston, you have quite quite a few of these tombs, and the most prominent families would 
would would have these tombs. So they didn't. So their family members were not not marked by individual um, gravestones. They were all buried in one tomb. And in of course in you know in um, in um, Maine, these are very rare. The only one that I know of from the 18th century is the Pepperell family tomb, which is a raised. Oh, um, within within York, there are a couple of tombs in the corner of the um, burial ground, yeah, close and, to the street. Yeah, and there's there's a more recent one up on Mount Agamemnicus that mm -hmm. we talked about the place. Oh, yeah, from, which was never um, nobody was ever interned there. Um, so oh. it's, it's empty. Ah, <laughs> oh, empty tomb. Interesting. But as far as impuritanism, is it was it more significant to be put in a tomb versus uh, be buried? I would say that it carried no, you know, technical the theological meaning. Although it did sort of matter in terms of practical, you know, piety, because it meant that you could actually visit the coffins and view the corpses if you really wanted to of people who, in your family who had died earlier. And wow. so in the diaries of some prominent Puritans within Boston, you do see the mention that they go into their family tombs sometimes. They look at the coffin of their great grand grandmother or something and you know, think, think about yeah. death or think about how awesome you know, this person was um, or their memories of childhood or something, which you know, ordinary people could, could do. So the tomb gave you that opportunity do yeah. that wow <laughs> yeah so i think that um we have covered for much we've talked for an hour i think that's great um, and, and um i know that our um did anyone uh, have any any questions no, in the comments i haven't seen any questions we've <laughs> had a good flow of viewers though um but i don't see any questions but if you do watch this if anybody out there is watching this after it's live feel free to uh, leave us some questions. We know that people do watch it after we broadcast it. So um, even though we don't seem to have a, a huge audience out there, we'll see that a lot of people watch it. Um, so please ask any question. Danny is a member of your history group, I believe, Danny. So, oh, yes. Yeah, and so you can just reach out to mm -hmm. him right here or you know, put your question below. And, and I, I should mention also, I was gonna mention this, that um, I do, I am a, um, a um, old, um, old um, York uh, tour tour guide I've been giving tours there for almost 10 years now I, I really love be able to you know uh, talk about history to anyone you know who wants to sign up for the walking tours and I have been started last year giving a sort of burial ground first parish burial ground tour which I really love doing and um, if you want to learn learn more and actually see the stones I'm talking about then feel free to come on the Barrow Grand Tour, which will be offered this summer. The it's actually being offered next, starting next Thursday, the twenty fourth, and then twenty fifth, twenty sixth. I will be traveling, so I won't be giving those, but one of my trusted colleagues will, and she will be do an excellent job. I yeah, I'm certain. Yeah, and I'd like to let people know that don't know there are two first parish burying grounds. Um, True. One's across the street from the other, one's on the front side of the church on the other side of York Street, and the other is behind the First Parish Church. And the old one is the one that's on the other side of York Street. Mm -hmm. and, and you can go there, um, people can just go there also and check it out. Um, and I did, and so I did ask uh, Todd Frederick, who oh, is yeah. the intendant over the, um, see, this is taking um, a little bit longer than I thought. <laughs> but it's so interesting, Annie, it's hard just to stop, but we will, yeah. we, I promise we will. Um, and Todd is the superintendent of the first parish, and I asked him about the orientation of the stones um, as he knows them today, and he wrote back and he said the tradition was the head was west and feet are east. When you rise, you are facing the east. The upper woodland was designed in the shape of a bell, not aware as to why this design feature, certainly a design that is a challenge to manage. So the the uh, the second parish cemetery, I guess, is that a cemetery? Or is that still a burying ground? It's a cemetery. The, um, second parish one. That's no, no, the, no, one. the one behind the oh, church. Oh, that is a um, cemetery. I would call it. Yeah. Yeah. So the cemetery, um, it, it's laid out pretty much uh, in a grid pattern, and I guess that the roads are laid out east to west. And do you mm -hmm. want to talk about that just a little bit? Well, um, that's what we see in almost all 70th century you know, through the end of the, um, well, through the middle of the 
um, 18th century is that, you know, as, as you just read, the people's bodies will be placed so that they rise up facing east, which is where Jesus was thought to come from come from where the sun rises in the east on the last day and so if the uh, people were saved then they would rise to face jesus and i always think it's funny that you know what if they put someone in facing the uh, wrong wrong way and he would came up and everyone else was facing i saw jesus and he was like where what you know i can't see anything <laughs> so that's what they were worried about well also so the the second coming then um mm -hmm is uh significant in that was that an element of further hope or was it despair <laughs> um it really varied um for many people it was an, a major hopeful moment okay so so they were presuming that they were doomed to hell mm -hmm. and then but once christ came again they would rise up and then they would be in favor of mm. their maker. well if, if they were doomed to um, to um, they, hell, then yeah. they were not going to be saved at the last judgment. And they wouldn't rise and they didn't need to be oriented. No. <laughs> no, yeah, right. But, you know, everyone had to have a, a little hope. So just in case they, they were going to be saved, you wanted to be certain that you'd be facing the right yeah. way. But for some people, you know, the second, the last judgment was seen as very hopeful. Yeah yeah okay good that's that's nice to know um and also i've i've, I've noticed as i walk through the the woods and fields and i come across uh, uh family cemeteries um that they're just they can be randomly the headstones are randomly placed and the inscriptions are sometimes on this but on the other side of the foot so they'd be facing away from the footstones and some would be facing the footstones so it seems like it probably was just up to whoever dug the hole and and set the stone maybe and oh yeah that, yeah and that's how they arrived at those orientations oh yeah definitely and, and some of those places are pretty remote so they probably had no churches and they weren't concerned about um damnation right right yeah definitely we didn't really talk about family plots in uh, general yeah but that's something we could talk about in a yeah. future yeah. zoom yeah yeah i think so i think so okay all right so great so thank you so much Jenny. this has been a, a real pleasure i'm really glad you joined us and um if you hold on just a minute, I'm going to log off Facebook.